أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على إمام القبلتين ونبي الحرمين وأفضل الثقلين وجد الحسن والحسين الذي سمي في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأب القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الصادقين والذين ذهب الله عنهم الرنس وطاحرهم تطيرا اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على صاحب الدعوة النبوية والسولة الحيدرية والاسمة الفاطمية والحلم الحسني والشجاعة الحسينية والإبادة السجادية والمآثر الباقرية والآثار الجعفرية والعلوم الكاذبية والحجج الردبية والجود الثقبية والنقابة النكبية والحيبة الأسكرية والغيبة الإلهية اللهم عجل فرجة وصاه المخرجة أما بعد فقد قال الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وابتغوا إليه الوسيلة وجاهدوا في سبيله لعلكم تفلحون صدق الله العلي العظيم For the love of Ahlul Bayt alayhim wa salam sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad For the love of Fatima to Zahra in particular, a second salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. To give our condolences to the Imam of our time on these occasions of the remembrance of his grandfather Hussein, a louder salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Indeed, one of the most controversial and prevalent questions in Islamic theology is the question pertaining to whether one can place intermediaries before Allah. When one comes to the realm of Shia Sunni dialogue, you find that this question is one which is often asked, but even within each school of thought, you find that this is a question which is debated. For example, within the Sunni world, you'll find one side that says that every form of intermediation before Allah is a bid'ah and an innovation. But then on the other side, you'll find that many of the different Sufi orders, they'll hold on to individuals they take as an intermediary before Allah. As in when you go to Iraq, in Baghdad, one of those personalities buried in Baghdad is Abdul Qadir al-Gilani. Abdul Qadir al-Gilani, one of his names, according to them, is al-Ghawtul A'adam, that the greatest pole or source of help. So you find that even over there, there is a wide range of divergence of opinions. But even today, within the school of Ahlul Bayt, you find that there are many different speakers. Some will bring forth the claim that to place the imams in your du'as, or to ask through the imams is not something which is God-centric. That they will pose the claim that when you look at a sahifat al sajjadiya and you look at many of the du'as over there, but then when you compare that to du'a and nudba or you compare that to a du'a like du'a at tawassul it seems as if there are two different imams presenting du'as in front of you. Because on one side, you find du'as that are focused upon Allah. And on the other side, you find du'as where the imams are being placed as intermediaries before Allah. When you see such divergence of views and opinions, 
it's important for us to analyze this topic and to get to the core of this discussion. You see, those from other schools of thought, they would bring forth the argument that if you believe in the principle of God's oneness to such an extent that you do not even imagine a partner for Allah in your mind and your imagination, then how is it possible that you make Rasulullah an intermediary? And how is it possible that you make Amir al-Mu'mineen an intermediary? And how is it possible that you make Fatima to Zahra an intermediary? In other words, if I'm going to rephrase their argument, their argument can be rephrased in the following manner. They say that your relationship with your imams is different than our relationship with our leaders. Why? Because when they say that Abu Hanifa is an imam, and a Shafi'i is an imam, and Malik bin Anas is an imam, and Ahmad bin Hanbal is an imam, what is the relation over there? The relation over there is the relation of a student to a teacher. That in other words, these individuals are imams and guides because they, but they give knowledge and the followers of these imams, they take their knowledge in that specific area. But they'll say when you have the concept of imamat in the school of Ahlul Bayt, it is very different. Because for us, the imams are not just a source of knowledge. But for us, the imams are an intermediary through which we reach Allah. And they will say that this doesn't make sense at the level of aqal nor at the level of the text. For example, they'll say that the Quran, it says in Surah Qaf, in the 50th chapter of the Quran, that says, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ That does Allah not in the Quran say that we are closer to man than his jugular vein? If Allah is this close to mankind, then why do you need an intermediary? Or they'll say that, have you not read Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 186? Allah, he says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي anni فَإِنِّي قَرِيبُ جِيبُ دَعْوَةُ إِذَا دَآن The verse says that when my servant asks from me, I answer them, and I reply to their supplication. Over here in this ayat, it is saying, ask from Allah, yet you believe in the concept of an intermediary. At the third level, they'll say that the Quran says, Iyaka nasta'in in Surah al fatiha which each and every one of us recite multiple times a day. When you say, Iyaka nasta'in, what does this mean? This means that, oh Allah, only you I am asking help for. Further than that, when you look at the Quran, the Quran in Surah Al-Zumar, in chapter 39, verse 3, it condemns the mushrikun and the idolaters of Quraysh. And you know how it condemns them? When it mentions their idol worship, the Quran quotes the reply of these individuals. When they reply to this claim, they say about the idols, that ma na'buduhum illa liyuqarribuna ilallahi zulfa. That the only reason that we worship these idols is because they bring us closer to Allah. You see, the mushrikun of Quraysh, they had an understanding of Allah as the ultimate deity. But these idols to them were a wasila towards Allah. So based upon that, they'll say, that your mindset of you Shia who take the Imams as a wasila inter intermediary is the same mindset of these idolaters who would ascribe partners to Allah. So you find when such arguments have been constructed, it is important that we understand this issue and we get to the core of the question that whether wasila or placing an intermediary before God is a recommendation and a sunnah, or it is a bid'ah and an innovation in the religion of Islam. And tonight, my subject of analysis is going to answer this question. At the first level, we'll discuss this question from the level of logic and philosophy. 
from the second level, will examine this question in light of the ayat of the Quran. From the third level, we'll examine what are the different forms of tawassul that we see in the Quran and the Hadith. Number four, we'll examine the sunnah of Rasulullah to see that is there any occasion in the life of Rasulullah where he uses tawassul. And at the final level, we'll examine that why are there certain duas in a sayyifat al sajjadiya where Imam Zainul Abidin says, La wasilatana ilayka illa ant. That, oh Allah, we have no wasila to reach you. And based on these points, we'll examine this discussion. You see, when it comes to the discussion of tawassul, whether it is a sunnah or a bid'ah, whether it is a recommendation or an innovation, you find the first level of this discussion is a rational discussion. Oftentimes in Islamic theology, before we come to the Quran and the Hadith, we have to use our aql to establish certain principles. For example, if I told you that what is your proof that Allah exists, you are not going to reply by saying that the Quran says Allah exists, therefore Allah exists. Why? Because this would be a circular argument. The authority of the Quran only comes when you believe in a creator. So we cannot use the Quran to establish the existence of God. We must use our rationale to come to that conclusion. In the same way, you find that there is a rational element of tawassul, and that rational element of tawassul relates to the subject of cause and effect. You see, whenever you have a relationship of cause and effect, for example, there is a fire in front of you, and that fire burns an object, there are two things which are necessary for that object to burn. The first thing is that you need an initiator or a muqtadi in the Arabic language. In this example, the fire is what initiates burning. And at the second level, there are certain shart and conditions that are needed that when those conditions are met, that object will burn. And in this example, it is the closeness of the object to the fire. You find in the same way, when we expand on this discussion, when you look in the Quran, in chapter 7, Surah Al-A'raf, verse 45, Allah mentions that when it comes to his domain of rule, there are two levels of the domain of Allah. And it says in that chapter, amar. In other words, there is one which is called Alamul Khalq and the realm of creation. The second is Alamul Amar, the realm of Allah's command. You know, in the realm of Allah's command, there is no need for an intermediary. The Quran in Surah Yasin, in the 36th chapter of the Quran, in the 82nd verse, it says, إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا أَنْ يَقُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ That when Allah intends a matter, He deems for it to be and it becomes. Over here, when Allah deems a command, there is no intermediary in that realm. That's why when it comes to the soul, it is stated by Muslim theologians and philosophers alike that the soul was created in one go. And when the Quran describes the soul, it says, That they, O Prophet, they ask you about the soul, That when you describe and answer this question to them, you say the soul is of the Amar and the command of my Lord. That is why since the soul is from the realm of God's command, there's no intermediary. But when it comes to the human body, the situation is different. Because the human body is from the realm of creation. At the end of the day, we say that Allah is the Khalik. Allah is the creator but we don't see human beings popping up magically upon this earth. There are conditions. One of those conditions is that man and woman come together. At the ultimate level, yes, Allah is the creator, but for Allah to bring about man, there is a wasila which is used in creation. That's why the concept of intermediaries is something which is very natural and something which is a part and parcel of our life. Even in the morning, if we wake up and we eat a piece of bread, 
Where does that bread come from? The first intermediary is that you picked up the ingredients or you bought that bread from the grocery store. Before that, it was in a factory where it was produced. Before that, it was grown from the ground. Even before that bread reaches your table, there are a number of steps of intermediaries that are taken before that bread reaches your table. No, I'll give you another example. In Surah Al-Shu'ara, chapter 26, there is a line of the Prophet Ibrahim. And the Prophet Ibrahim, he says, وَإِذَا مَرِدْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينِ That when I am sick, Allah is the one who cures me. When a person has an illness, they do not become magically cured. You find at one level, medicine is a cure. There is no one in the Muslim Ummah who is saying that it is a bid'ah, it is an innovation to take medicine, that you are relying upon anyone other than Allah. But at the second level, the Prophet Muhammad is saying that an intermediary doesn't just have to be a physical intermediary, but an intermediary can come from the realm of the unseen as well. That's why there is a hadith of Rasulullah where the Prophet says, Inna sadaqa tadfa'ul bala. That for example, sadaqa, it keeps harm away from a person. Or for example, Imam al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. The Imam says, وَتَصَدَّقُوا That give sadaqa and cure the ill ones amongst you by giving sadaqa. So you find over here that this ayat, Surah Al-Shu'ara, that verse from the 26th chapter, the Prophet Ibrahim said that Allah cures me. But when cure comes, either it comes from an intermediary on the spiritual realm or it comes through the physical realm in the form of medicine, for example. You know, those individuals who said that Allah is closer than the jugular vein. And if Allah is closer than the jugular vein, why do you need an intermediary before Allah? There is one major philosophical mistake in this question. And you know what that mistake is? They assume that us being close to Allah is the same as Allah being close to us which is kind of counterintuitive at one level. You know, if I say that this clock is five feet from me, then naturally I am five feet from the clock. But when you look at the ayat of the Quran, none of the verses of the Quran say, oh man, you are close to Allah. But the verses, they say, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ But we are closer to them than the jugular vein. You see, this goes to show there are two types of closeness. Number one is a real type of closeness. In that real sense of closeness, God is always close to us. No matter what we do, Allah is always closer than the jugular vein. But at the second level, because of our negligence, we ourselves have distanced ourselves from God. You know, whenever a relationship between two groups, they change. Either it is because party A changed, or party B changed, or both parties, they changed. When it comes to our relationship with God, Allah does not change in his essence. So if there is any change in our relationship with God, then it's coming from ourselves. It's because we ourselves have become distant. And if we ourselves have become distant, then you find it is very natural that there are certain means and mechanisms within this world that we can use to come closer towards Allah. That's why when you look in the Quran, there are several ayat and verses which show that God uses certain entities and he tells mankind, hold on to these entities. When you hold on to them, they will serve as a means of closeness towards me. For example, in one verse, Allah, he says, Allah in this ayat, which is found in Surah Al-Baqarah, he is commanding mankind that take that maqam of the Prophet Ibrahim and Hajj, which is still present today, take that as a spot of prayer. I say, oh Allah, the entire earth belongs to you. 
everything is within your dominion, then why are you telling me that I should pray at that spot where the Prophet Ibrahim stood? Allah is showing to us in this ayat the principle that there are certain locations in space, that there are certain makans, there are certain places where they have an aura of spirituality. And those places are an intermediary towards my closeness. In other words, they are a wasida. So if we have a hadith which says that the duas under the qubba and the dome of Imam al Hussein are accepted, this doesn't contradict the Quran. You find Allah is shown in the Quran that there are certain places which emanate spirituality. You know, each of us in our worldly life, we recognize that there are certain places that may bring us peace because of the memories associated with it or the environment. For one person, it may be a library. For another person, it may be a park. For another person, it may be something else. God is showing in the same way in your personal life, certain places bring an effect upon you. In the same way, closeness to me, there are certain places that emanate spirituality. Places like the places where the imams are buried. So you find this is one example. The second thing that you see in the Quran is that the Quran in chapter 97, which each of you know, it says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr that we reveal the Qur'an on the night of Qadr. In this chapter, Allah is showing, O mankind, in the way that there is a wasila, an intermediary in space, which brings you closer to Allah, there are also certain time periods which are a wasila and an intermediary bringing you closer to Allah. These time periods are associated with spirituality like the night of Qadr, or many of the devotional days within our calendar. So if we have a tradition that says that the one who does the ziyara of Imam al Hussein on the 15th of Sha'ban, it is as if that person has shaken the hand of 124,000 Anbiya, then such a tradition doesn't contradict the Quran. Because the Quran establishes that there are certain special time periods which emanates spirituality. So this is the second level. The third thing the Quran shows in chapter 2, verse 45, is that even certain actions can be means of closeness towards Allah, that there are certain actions which are a wasila before Allah. For example, Allah within this verse, it says, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِسَبْرِ salat That, O you who believe, Seek help through what? Through patience and prayer. Have you heard anyone in the Muslim Ummah say that the Quran in Surah Al-Fatiha says that only seek help from Allah over here it is saying seek help from prayer. This is a bidah and a contradiction. No, no one says this because the Quran is highlighting in the way certain places are a wasila and a means to God's closeness. And certain time periods are a wasila and a means to God's closeness. In the same way, certain actions, they emanate spirituality. And these actions bring you closer to Allah at the third level. Then when we look farther, when we go to the fourth level of the discussion, we find that the Quran even highlights that certain objects can be a means of closeness to Allah or Allah can use them as a wasila. When you look in Surah Yusuf, in chapter 12, verse 93, after Yusuf, he is thrown in the well and he goes through his journey where he ends up as the economic minister of Egypt, a point had come where there was a famine within that land. And when there was a famine in that land, the brothers of Yusuf, they came to Yusuf to ask for rations and grains to feed themselves. When they came to Yusuf, they initially did not recognize Yusuf. And eventually the story had concludes that when they recognize Yusuf, they mentioned to Yusuf that our father has become blind. And the Quran says, وَبِيَدَّتْ أَيْنَاءُ مِنَ الْحُزَنْ that the Prophet Yaqub cried so much for his son Yusuf upon separation from him that it is stated that he became blind out of that sorrow. You know what Yusuf says? Yusuf says something very interesting. 
He doesn't say, tell my father to make dua to Allah. And he doesn't say, tell my father that why are you asking help from others? No, what Yusuf he says is, idhabu bi qamisi hada fa alkuhu ala wajhi abi yati basira. That take this shirt of mine, and when you take this shirt of mine and you place it upon the face of my father, his vision will come back that you find this object was a means of giving shifa towards Yaqub. And then the Quran mentions something even stranger. It says, وَلَمَّ فَصَلَتْ الْإِيرُ That when the caravan takes that shirt of Yusuf, and at that point Yusuf is in Egypt, and it's stated in certain sources that Yaqub was in Canaan, but regardless of where he was, he was at a distant place. The Quran is saying, that on one side, the caravan of the brothers is returning to their father, and it's returning with the shirt. Certain brothers were with Yaqub, and certain brothers were with the caravan. It says that as soon as the caravan leaves with the shirt of Yusuf, Yaqub, he smells the shirt. And the brothers, they say to their father that, you are making your same old mistakes. That in other words, Yaqub says to the brothers who were with him that I smell the shirt of my son. And they reply that you are just being a father, that out of the memory of your son, because they did not smell the shirt. Now I ask you, is fragrance a physical reality or is it a spiritual reality? Fragrance is something physical. If there is cologne or perfume in the room, it's not just that a mu'min will smell the perfume and a non-believer won't smell the perfume. But over here, what this is showing is that if there are certain objects which are a wasila and an intermediary towards shafa, they may manifest that shafa for those who have marifat and those who do not have marifat, it may not manifest. Because Yaqub had understanding of Yusuf, whereas the brothers, they did not have that understanding at the same level. So you find this is another level. But at the final level, when you look into the Quran, you find these brothers, after they recognize their mistake, the Quran in chapter 12, verses 96 and 97, they said, قَالُوا يَا أَبَانَا That, O oh, our father, Istagfirlana dunubana inna kunna khatain. That, oh, our father, ask Allah to forgive us because we were sinners. And then in the next verse, Allah says, Qala sofa astagfiru lakum rabbi. That Yaqub replied, That I will ask forgiveness from Allah. What this ayat is showing is that even though these individuals could have called upon Allah, they chose to go to their father, Yaqub, who was a spiritual individual to make dua. But as we look at all of the ayat and the verses of the Quran, there is one verse of the Quran which establishes that a wasila and an intermediary is a mandate of the religion and not a bidah more clearer than any other verse. You know what verse is that? That is Surah Al-Ma'idah. Chapter 5, verse 35. Within this verse, Allah is saying, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu ittaqullah wabtagu ilayhi alwasila wa jahidu fi sabilihi la'allakum tuflihun. In this verse, Allah is saying that, O oh, you who believe, number one, have taqwa, be God conscious. But at the second level, use an intermediary to reach Allah. You see, when you look at this verse, the nature of this verse is that it is unrestricted. It doesn't tell us what type of intermediary to use. Because it is unrestricted, we need to examine the Quran and the Hadith to see what type of intermediaries were used within the Quran and the Hadith. You know, there are some individuals, when they interpreted this ayat, they said that this ayat, it means have amal saleh have righteous actions, and that is what it's referring to. I say, are you going to teach Allah how to reveal the Quran? If Allah wanted it to mean righteous actions, he would have used the word righteous actions. But over here, Allah uses the word wasila specifically, intermediary specifically. 
You see, that's why when you look at the Quran and the Hadith, you find that there are seven to eight different forms of tawassul in the Quran and the Hadith. And one mistake we make is that we assume that those outside of the school of Ahlul Bayt are against all of these forms of tawassul. No, out of these seven to eight different forms, there are four to five forms of tawassul that the entire Muslim ummah agrees upon. That there is no doubt in the Muslim ummah that this intermediary before Allah is acceptable. For example, the first form of tawassul is to take the names of Allah as an intermediary. Because at the end of the day, the names of Allah are different from Allah's essence himself. The Quran, it says that وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا That to Allah belong the best of names and call Allah by these names. When we go in Shah Ramadan and we recite that famous dua known as Dua Joshan al-Kabir, the dua of the shield, as we can say, which shields you from all harms, in that dua, what are we saying? We're saying, Allahumma inni as'aluka ya Allahu, ya Rahmanu, ya Karimu, ya Muqimu. And in that manner, we call name after name of Allah. In the same way, when you look outside of the school of Ahlul Bayt, they have the same concept of calling upon Allah's names. For example, in the famous work of a hadith by At-Tirmizi, there is a narration by Abdullah ibn Buraida who narrates from his father, and his father states that I saw Rasulullah stand in front of a man who was making this dua. And you know what that dua was? That man was saying, Ashhadu annaka bi anni ansallah. La ilaha illa an subhanaka inni kuntu min al-dalameen al-ahad al-samad al-lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. That man was saying, I bear witness that you are Allah. You are the one that there is no God besides. That I am a wrongdoer. And amongst your titles is the one who is the one, the one who is independent, yet everyone is dependent upon him. And so on and so forth. It is stated in that hadith that Rasulullah praises this dua. So we find number one, the first form of tawassul, which is to use the names of God as an intermediary. The entire Muslim ummah accepts this. There is no debate about this. The second form of tawassul is to use the Quran as a wasila and an intermediary before Allah. You know, on the night of what? On the night of Qadr, what do we do? We open the Quran in front of us. We place the Quran upon our head and we say, Allahumma inni asaluka bi kitabik al munzal wa ma fihi wa fihi ismuk al akbar wa asma'uk al husna. That, oh Allah, I ask you by the right of this Quran that in the way this Quran is in front of me, I am using this Quran as an intermediary to gain closer towards you. The question is, is that are other Muslims in agreement that you can say, Oh Allah, I ask you through the right of this Quran? The answer is the entire Muslim ummah agrees. You know, there is a hadith in Sahih al-Muslim. The Ravi is Imran ibn al Hussein, And he narrates from Rasulullah that Rasulullah said, Iqra al-Quran, was'alullah tabarak wa ta'ala bihi, qabla in yajiya qawman yas'aluna bihin nas. That the Prophet is ascribed in their tradition to have said that read the Quran and ask Allah through the right of this Quran. Before a group of people uses the Quran to ask from mankind instead of Allah. So at the second level, in the way the entire Muslim Ummah is in agreement that the names of Allah are a form of wasila and tawassul. The entire Muslim Ummah is in agreement that the Quran can also be an intermediary. Now, if there was a group that Rasulullah placed alongside the Qur'an, and the Prophet said that obeying them is like obeying the Qur'an, then you find it is only natural that such a group would be an intermediary as well. So you find this is the second level. The third level is that we find that the third form of tawassul is that you say, Oh Allah, because of this righteous action that I did, I am asking you to give me something. When you look in the Quran, there is an ayat of the Quran that says that, 
ربنا تقبل منا انك انت السميع العليم واجعلنا مسلمين لك that ibrahim and ismail the quran is saying that after they laid the foundations of the kaaba they turn to Allah and they say, Oh Allah, allow us to be those who always submit to you and accept from us. You know what this ayat is showing? This ayat is showing, O oh mankind, that after you do a righteous deed and a righteous action, then is the time to ask from Allah. That's why in these majalis, when we do the zikr of Ahlul Bayt, as soon as the majlis is finished, we raise our hands and dua to ask from Allah. Because now the hearts are softened because we shed tears for Sayyid al Shohada. That's why Sheikh Jafar al Shushtari, when he would describe the majalis of Sayyid al Shohada, he would say that it is ka'annakum tahta qubbat al Hussein. That when you sit in these majalis, it's as if you are sitting underneath the dome of Sayyid al Shohada. And what is the quality of the dome of Sayyid al-Shuhada? The quality is, is that those duas under the dome of the Imam are accepted. And that's why in one level, the rate of the acceptance of our duas is increased within these majalis. Because the third form of tawassul is that after a righteous action, you turn to Allah. You know, even in Bukhari, there is a hadith which describes the incident from Surah Al-Kahf. You know, in Surah Al-Kahf, there's the ayat, Am hasibta anna ashab al-kahfi wa raqimi kanu min ayatina ajaba. That indeed the people of the cave and the inscription are from amongst her astonishing signs. That hadith in Bukhari, it describes what is that inscription. It says that one of those people of the cave, when they woke up, they said, Oh Allah, there was a time in my life when I had nothing. And I took a loan and I gained a large business. But when the time came to repay that loan, I couldn't remember the amount that that person had given me as a loan. So out of ahtiyat and precaution, I gave my entire business in the way of God. And it is stated in that hadith, he says, Oh Allah, I ask through the right of this action and the stone begins to move. In this way, the other two, they ask and the stone begins to move. So you find in hadith and the Quran, which is accepted by all Muslims, the third form of tawassul isn't controversial. Because everyone asks that you can use an action and you can say, Oh Allah, I ask you through the right of this action. That's why in dua tawassul, we say those famous lines, wa wa arju najatan min Allah. That, oh Allah, if there is any action which is worthy in my life to place before you, then that action is only the love of these individuals and the closeness to these individuals, the Prophet and his Ahlul Bayt. So you find this is the third level. The fourth form of tawassul, which I said the entire Muslim Ummah accepts, is that another mu'min can make a dua for another believer. The Quran says that the believers are those individuals who say, Rabbana gfir lana wa li ikhwanina alladheena sabakuna bil iman. That the believers are those that when they make dua, they say, Oh Allah, ask, uh, forgive us and forgive those who came before us that had belief. That's why a number of traditions, they say that when your dua is not accepted, pray for others and then make dua for yourself. That for example, it says in one tradition that the one who makes dua for 40 individuals before him, Allah accepts that dua. So all of these different forms of tawassul, up to these four forms, using the names of Allah, using the Quran as a form of tawassul, using a righteous action and saying, oh Allah, I ask through the right of this action, using another believer to make dua for you, everyone accepts. But now when we come to the fifth form, even here everyone is in agreement under certain conditions. The fifth form of tawassul is that can one use the Prophet Muhammad as an intermediary before Allah? Over here one group said 
that as long as the Prophet is alive, and as long as he is in front of you, and as long as he is able to help you, you can use Rasulullah as a wasila. But the moment any of these conditions are not there, then Rasulullah is not able to be used as a wasila. This is despite the fact that when you go to the Quran, in chapter 4, verse 64, it is stated, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ إِدَّلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ جَاءُوكَ That Allah tells the believers that when you wrong yourselves, they should go to you, O Muhammad. فَاسْتَغْفَرُ اللَّهَ وَاسْتَغْفَرَ لَهُمُ الرَّسُولَ لَوَجَدُ اللَّهَ تَوَّابًا رَحِيمًا You know, this ayat is very strange. It says that when the believers wrong themselves, the first thing they do is that they go to the Prophet Muhammad, number one. Number two, they ask Allah to forgive them. But then at the third level, they will only be forgiven if Rasul Allah makes dua for them to be forgiven. In other words, it is showing in this ayat that even if you're asking forgiveness from Allah, then go to the Prophet and the dua of the Prophet is something which is powerful for you. So you find that this is the next form of tawassul. But at the next form, you find there is even more controversy. Because over here in this ayat, it is about Rasul Allah. Is he able to make a dua for you after he's passed away? Now the question is, is that can you say, Oh Allah, I ask through the right of Prophet Muhammad. Oh Allah, I ask through the right of Ali ibn Abi Talib. I ask through the right of Fatima al-Zahra salam Allahi alayha. This is the question in discussion. Now over here to understand this question, there is one pivotal preliminary question. That preliminary question is this. Is that when a person passes away, are they completely disconnected from this world? Or do they have a connection with this world? If the Prophet Muhammad, Amir al-Mu'mineen, janab zahra if they have died and there is no connection with this world, then yes, there is no tawassul. But if there is a connection, then it opens the door for there to be a form of tawassul and intermediation. Over here, when you look in the Quran, there are a number of ayat of the Quran which demonstrate that those people who have passed away, they have a type of cognition and understanding of this world. In other words, they are aware of this world and they are able to even make dua for those within this world. For example, in Surat Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 169 and 170. <laughs> That do not say those killed in the way of Allah are dead, but they are alive and they're receiving sustenance from their Lord. The problem is, is that many people, when they quote this ayat, they stop over here. They don't quote the entire verse. This portion of the verse doesn't necessarily prove that there is a connection in a solid way and then they're cognizant. But the next portion of the verse it says that farihina bima atahum Allahu min fadli. This group of people who are killed in the way of Allah. Not only are they receiving rizq and sustenance from Allah, but they are happy because of the blessings which Allah has given. And then it says wa yastabshiruna billadina lam yalhaku bihim bil iman. And those believers who they left behind, they are happy when they see the state of those believers. In other words, the Quran is mentioning that there is a group of individuals that even though they are dead and they have passed away, they are aware of the believers upon this world and they rejoice at the actions of the believers. This goes to show that there is a connection with this world. No, another example. In Surat Yasin, there was an individual by the name of Habibun Najjar. You know, many of you, you've read Surat Yasin, that some prophets, they go, a man, he comes, and he helps those prophets. This man, according to the Quranic commentators, wasn't a Nabi. 
He was a pious individual. The Quran says that after he was slain for helping these anbiya, these prophets, it is said to him, jannah, that enter paradise. You know what he replies by saying? He replies by saying, Ya layta qawmi ya'lamoon bima ghafarani rabbi wa ja'alani min al mukramin that how I wish that my people were able to see in the way that God has forgiven me and in what manner he has honored me. This goes to show this individual, even though he's passed away, he still remembers his people. And he is still thinking of his people. He is able to do that. So now you'll say to me, okay, we understand that from the level of those who have passed away, they have cognition of this world. But now the question is, is does the Quran demonstrate that those upon this earth can communicate with the dead? It's an important question. That if we are going to say, Ya Ali, Ya Hassan, Ya Hussein, Ya Rasulullah, there should be an example from the Quran that an individual communicated with a group of people who passed away, right? When you look in the Quran in Surah Al A'raf, it is mentioned about the people of Saleh. That these individuals, the people of Saleh, were overtaken by an earthquake and they were turned into corpses. At that moment, Saleh turns away from them and he begins to speak to them. And he says, Ya qawmi, laqad ablaghtu risalata rabbi. A prophet of God is speaking to the dead corpses of his people. And he is saying that I have delivered the message of my Lord. You know, there's a tradition in Sahih al-Bukhari that Abdullah ibn Umar, he narrates that one day as we're walking by the bodies of the shohada of Badr, Rasulullah begins to speak to the bodies of the shohada of Badr. And Abdullah ibn Umar says, at that moment, I replied by saying that, O oh, Rasulullah, you are speaking to dead individuals. Rasulullah said, O oh, man, they hear more than you hear. So you find the Quran and the Hadith establish that in the way those who have passed away, they have a connection with this world. In the same way, when we are in this world, there is a connection with those who have passed away. That's why when you look in the hadith, there are many examples where the ashab of Rasulullah put the Prophet Muhammad as a form of an intermediary. For example, there is one hadith that Uthman ibn Hunayf, and this hadith is narrated in the Sunan of Ibn Majah. And it is narrated in two different forms. One ravi is Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, and another ravi is Atiyah ibn al-Ju'fi. Both of these individuals, they narrate that Rasulullah, he said, Allahumma inni asaluka bihaqqis sa'ilina alayka wa bihaqqi mamshaya hada. That the Prophet Muhammad said, that I ask you, O oh Allah, through the right of those who ask from you. In other words, some claim that yes, tawassul is allowed, but Rasulullah never used tawassul. In this hadith, it is saying that Rasulullah said, Oh Allah, anyone who makes dua towards you, I ask through the right of that individual. You know, Imam Zainul Abidin has a similar dua when the month of Shah Ramadan was ending. The Imam would say, Allahumma inni as'aluka bihaqqi hadha shar wa man ta'abbada fihi. That I ask you, oh Allah, through the right of this month and through the haqq of whoever does ibadat within this month, that what is the maqam of the one who does the ibadat of Allah that Zainul Abideen is saying that man is our wasila. So you find this is mentioned in the tradition. Another tradition, it says, Uthman ibn Hunayf, that one day a blind man came to Rasulullah. And Rasulullah said to that man, say, Allahumma inni asaluka bihaqqi nabiyana Muhammad. That say, I asked through the right of our Prophet Muhammad, that man did so. But the question still remains. Yes, we had this discussion that in the Quran and in the Hadith, the wasul is there. There still must be some example from the seerah of Rasulullah where the Prophet used the wasul. Because at the end of the day, the pivotal question which remains 
is that Allah is greater than everything. And without a doubt, the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt are less than Allah. So why not go directly to the greater? Why are you using the lesser to reach the greater? You know, in our school of thought, Rasulullah is the greatest creation of God. And you find Ahlul Bayt, they follow Rasulullah. If Rasulullah did the tawassul and use Ahlul Bayt as an intermediary, you would answer this question. You know, Rasulullah is that individual that the duas of Rasulullah are mustajab. Whatever the Prophet asks, Allah gives towards him. The question is, is then why on the day of Mubahala, when the duas of Rasulullah are accepted, when the Prophet comes on the day of Mubahala, in his hand is Imam al Hussein, and he is holding the hand of Imam al Hassan, and behind him is Fatima al Zahra. And behind her is Amir al Mu'mineen. He says to his Ahlul Bayt, Ida da Otu fa amminu. When I make dua, you say Ameen. I say, Oh Rasulullah, no one has to say Ameen to your dua. Your dua is already accepted. If you want to point your finger and destroy the Christians of Najran, you are able to do so. That's why Ayatollah Abu Hassan al Isfahani would say, Ma al Kalimu wa ma al Asa wa ma al Hajaru. That what is the staff of Musa and what is the stone of Musa? Wa fi sababatihi shukk al Qamaru. That on one side Musa needed a staff and he needed a stone for water to come out. Rasulullah is the one he pointed his finger and the moon began to split in half. Rasulullah, he could have pointed to the Christians of Najran, they would have been destroyed. But now Rasulullah is turning to his Ahlul Bayt. And he is saying, when I make dua, you say Ameen. In other words, Rasulullah is saying, I, Muhammad, who does not need any wasila, if I am using a wasila, then it is these five individuals, it is my Ahlul Bayt. That the day of Mubahila was a demonstration to the Muslim Ummah. That if you are going to use a wasila, then my family is my wasila. You see, this is that reality we find from the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sunnah. But even then, one question which from that certain individuals from within the school of Ahlul Bayt they bring is that why do we have certain duas? from the imams that say la wasilatana ilayka illa ant that for example in one dua in a sahifat sajadiya imam zainul abidin says oh allah i have no means to reach you except you is this not a clear showing that our duas have contradictions within them one dua, like dua al-nudba, is all about the imams, for example, and their virtues. It mentions God, but a great portion is dedicated to the fadail of the imams. But over here, Imam Zainul Abidin is saying that I have no means to reach you except your own self. What these duas are showing is that if there is anyone who is independent in their authority, it is Allah. But every other form of wasila is dependent on God. For example, Allah in one verse of the Quran says, Allahu yatawaffal anfusa hina mawtiha. That Allah takes the souls at the time of death. But you and I, each of us know that Malak al maut is the one who is taking the souls. Another verse says, Qul yatawaffal anfusa malak al maut. That Malak al maut takes it. This goes to show that at the end of the day, the ultimate authority of the angel of death is derived from God. But he is the one carrying out the action. When the imam says there is no means to reach you, the imam is highlighting that you are the only independent means and every other reality is dependent upon you. You see, one of the philosophies of tawassul, besides duas being accepted, is that through tawassul, you build an attachment to those personalities. These days of Muharram are not a mere academic or intellectual pursuit, but these are those days where we seek to connect our hearts with Ahlul Bayt alayhum as And one of those tragedies which the hearts they connect to 
is the tragedy of the son of Imam al Hassan Qasim. You know, how did Sayyid al Shohada treat Qasim? It is stated that when Qasim passed away, and Imam al Hussein brought the body of Qasim back to the tent, you know where Imam al Hussein placed the body of Qasim? He saw the broken body of Ali Akbar on the ground. And Imam al Hussein places the body of his nephew next to the body of his son, Ali Akbar. It's as if Sayyid al Shohada, every time he would see Qasim, he would remember of the musibah of his brother, Imam al Hassan. That you know, the Masayib of Imam al Hassan, it stated that one day that Imam al Hassan was upon his prayer mat. And as Imam al Hassan is upon his musalla, a person he comes, he pulls the prayer mat from underneath Imam al Hassan. And he takes a dagger and he stabs the thigh of Imam al Hassan. No, what is the musiba of Imam al Hassan? You know, every Imam, they would find peace within their home. But Imam al Hassan is that Imam, when he was within his home, he was poisoned from within his home. It stated that after the poison was going through the body of Imam al Hassan, a point it comes where the Imam, he begins to vomit portions of his liver. And as he's vomiting portions of his liver, he ducks that bowl which contained those portions. Imam al Hussein says, oh my brother, why are you doing this? Imam al Hussein, uh, Imam al Hassan says, oh Hussein, I do not want Zainab and Umm Kulthum to see this. I saw, oh Imam al Hassan, a point will come on the day of Ashura when Sayyid Zainab will be standing at the tent was Shimar Jalisun ala Sadr al Hussein. That Shimar would be sitting on the chest of Aba Abdullah. After that, Imam al Hussein. He begins to cry the moment the Imam he cries. Imam al Hassan says, Ya Aba Abdullah, Atabki Aliya, that, oh Hussein, do you cry over me? The Imam says, Yes. Imam al Hassan says, Abki Aleika, Ya Aba Abdullah, that, oh Aba Abdullah, if there is anyone who deserves to be cried over, then you are that individual. La Yom Ka Yomika Ya. Aba Abdullah, that there is no day like your day, O oh Hussein. You know, it's as if in those final moments, Qasim would be there by his father as well. And Imam al Hassan would tell Qasim, O oh Qasim, even though he's a child, a day will come where your uncle will be in need of help. You know, the night before Ashura had come. And as that night it comes, Imam al Hussein he gathers his companions in the darkness of the night. And as he gathers his companions, he begins to list the names of the Shohada. And as he's listing the names of the Shohada, Qasim is waiting for his name to be called. But as the name of Qasim isn't called, he goes to his uncle and he says, Oh, uncle, you didn't mention my name. The Imam says, Ya Qasim, keif al mawt indak, that how do you find death? Qasim, he says, Ahla min al asal, that death to me is sweeter than honey. You know, later I'll answer the perspective of one scholar that why did the Imam only ask this to Qasim? Qasim, he then says that, O oh, uncle, you mentioned that even Ali Azgar would be Shaheed tomorrow. Are they going to attack the tents? How is this infant going to be martyred? The Imam says, O oh, Qasim, a point will come. Azgar will be within my arms. I'll be asking for water for Ali Azgar. But instead of water, one arrow will come towards him. Min al Odoni el al Odon. From one ear of Ali Azgar, it'll go out the other ear of Ali Azgar. The day of Ashura it comes. Asim is waiting for the chance to go to the battlefield. 
Imam al Hussein doesn't give ijazah to Qasim. But a point it comes where the mother of Qasim says, Oh Qasim, your father had left something for you, Qasim. Take that towards your uncle. You find that he takes that towards his uncle. Imam al Hussein, he sees a letter from his brother Hassan al Mujtaba. You know, at that moment, Imam al Hussein does something that he doesn't do at the departure of Ali Akbar. And he doesn't do at the departure of Abbas. He doesn't do it at the departure of On and Muhammad. Sayyid ibn Ta he writes that as Imam al Hussein is bidding farewell to Qasim, both of them they embrace each other, they hug each other, and then it says, Baka ya hatta ghashya alayhima, that as they're holding each other, both of them cry so much until they fall unconscious upon the ground. After that, Imam al Hussein he ties the amama on the head of Qasim. Awesome. Hamid bin Muslim, he says, that as I would watch that young man come out of the tent, it's as if the face of that boy was like a glowing moon. And when I would look at him, that armor was too large for his body. And his sandal would fall off of his foot. And as I was watching the scene, Hussein comes towards Qasim and he places that sandal upon the feet of Qasim. Now that moment it comes that Qasim he goes to the battlefield. You know one scholar would say that why did Hussein only ask Qasim how do you find death? At the end of the day all of these shohada are martyred by why only ask Qasim? He says that when you read the maktal of Qasim, it is stated that one sword, it strikes the head of Qasim. And as Qasim is falling off his horse, the sandal of Qasim is caught in the horse. And as the horse is moving, the body of Qasim is being broken into pieces. Now he says the reason Hussein only asked Qasim is that every other shaheed, after they died, their body was was trampled. Qasim is that one shaheed. Qasim was Allah. <laughs> the body of Qasim. Imam al Hussein comes to the body of Qasim. You know, when the Imam would come to each of the shohada, he would say the align. When he came to the body of Abbas, he said, Alan in Kasra Dahri Abbas. That, oh Abbas, my back has become broken. When he went to the body of Ali Akbar, the Imam said, Ala dunya kalafa. That, oh Ali Akbar, may this world become khak and dust. But you know what the Imam says at the body of Qasim? He says, Azza wallah ala ammak. That, oh Qasim, how difficult is it for your uncle that you were asking me for help? But, oh Qasim, I wasn't able to help you on this day. Allah, <laughs> Allah,